Hi guys, Conrad from Game Music here. Some time ago I got the opportunity to ask few questions to the Cyberpunk 2077 composers. Here's the video of that interview exclusively for Game Music. Enjoy! What were the biggest challenges du during creation uh, of the soundtrack? For, from my point of view, I'd say the biggest challenge was making sure that it had a real kind of sense of fluid, of unity. You've got three different composers. Yes. But we all use different equipment. But yet it's still got to sound like it's, you know, it's all comprehensive. It's all sounding the same kind of vibe. So I think that was definitely sort of something that took a little while to work out at the beginning. But I've, I've said to those two before that I think the wonderful thing about this soundtrack is it's got so much energy and just so much attitude. But yet at the end, you can't really work out, is it PT? Is it Marcin? Is it me? It's got you know, certain flavors of all of us, but it's got this whole sense of unity, I, I would say. So, I mean, for me, the, the, the biggest difficulty was getting this big, this whole thing started and figuring out my way into the world and you know what to do what not to do it's easy with cyberpunk to fall into certain tropes and you know our sort of ambition was to create our own tropes so we tried to basically do things uh, a little bit differently than it uh, than it was in other cyberpunk related uh, forms of fiction so yeah, that that was probably it took, I don't know, maybe a year, maybe six months. I don't remember exactly, but it took a while to, you know, get this thing going. Right. But yeah, there was I... there was, sorry, much. I was just going to say, but there was definitely a time, wasn't there, when it suddenly kind of clicked in. Like if you're on a film soundtrack, you don't have a year to muck around. You've maybe got <laughs> a month if you're lucky to get going and try different sounds. Whereas on this, I think Martin, you'd sent an email going, Right, time to stop playing. It's time to start composing now. And it, but it really was true. It's like it took a year of just experimenting. And as as PT says, it's like you try and come up with tropes. There are things that have been done before. As there, as you have on any composition, you start from somewhere and say, "Ah, oh, it's been done before," or "That's the sound," or "That's how I've heard that before." And gradually, as you start playing, and particularly with three of us collaborating you suddenly come up with a sound that's like, oh, this is interesting. Haven't heard this before. Mm -hmm. And then someone else takes it and goes, oh, you could do this with it. And yeah, there was, I remember that. There was definitely that time when it kind of clicked into place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember when, uh, you know, way back before, during the first months of the project, before PT joined us and before we brought Paul uh, to complete the picture, I was trying to figure out with Adam, our creative director, how our next project would sound like. And I remember doing like, I don't know, 12, 13 iterations of, uh, let's say this reference track, the sample track that would, you know, draw or or showed us the direction we, we should follow from now on. And it was actually quite a struggle to, to, to find out what are we going to do? Because above all, we didn't want to mindlessly copy someone else's ideas because still this is our take on cyberpunk this is not just any cyberpunk it's cyberpunk 2077 which is based on pen and paper rpg made by mike Potsmith. so you know we got to work on very well established and described world also also lore wise so we also had to take that into consideration and for me i think both Piotr and Paul already told stuff about creative process, but for me also production-wise, it was quite a challenge because I've never worked on a project that big involving that big amount of creative people, uh, music-wise creative people, starting from you know session musicians to recording engineers to external artists so we, we've uh, commissioned to 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 do songs for us. Uh, it was one of a kind experience, really, and I am hoping not to repeat it too soon. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, 
Did you get a lot of reference tracks or the dev team let you go wild with the ideas at the beginning and in the in the in the later uh, period of uh, produ uh, production? So let me just start and then I'm going to leave the floor for, to, to to you guys. So basically the way how we work at CD Project Red is that we have complete trust on whatever creatively we are doing. Obviously our ideas need to be in line with general idea for the project so you know it needs to click together right so mm. uh because still we uh, our job is to create music that would elevate the experience not just create any music we think it would be fine right so we have to remember about you know our role in the project uh but having that said uh we actually had complete creative freedom which which is very nice very refreshing and also quite frightening because once you realize that there is there are no limitations to your to whatever your poor mind you know comes up with question is where do you stop so you know you need to draw a line yourself and and keep yourself in line to make sure that whatever you come up with still is cohesive and you know remains part of the one bigger picture rather than you know being a flow of random ideas that doesn't necessarily you know go to the same place well yeah i mean i'd say you, know, you talk about reference tracks and stuff but it goes back again to what we touched on five minutes ago is just that whole trope thing and it's like you're aware of other soundtracks whether it's for games or whether it's for films or whatever you know it doesn't really matter what your music's for you're just aware of music in general and as soon as you start listening too closely to other tracks either subconsciously or not you just end up going down that way so it really was more a case of experimenting i mean sure there was some stuff that we listened to but in general it was just playing around with all these synths that we've got you know and coming up with sounds and sending them back and i'd wake up you know, in the morning and those two have been working all day and say, hey, what do you think of this? Here's some stuff. I go, well, this is a little bit too loud to listen to at 7 a.m. But, you know, it sounds pretty good. <laughs> and then, you know, similarly, I then get working and then they get in the next morning and, and so on. It just it was that back and forth. But I think it was more being inspired by each other rather than being inspired by other stuff specifically. Mm. Yeah, one thing just to add to what Martin said, I think this is uh, really you know, uh, something that doesn't happen very often that uh, a music team is given that much creative freedom on a project. Usually, you know, uh, music sometimes is uh, like an afterthought or we need to have music <gasps> in the game or whatever. So, you know, just basically, or, or, or you know, there are people who are micromanagers. Uh, so that's certainly not the case uh, at CDPR. So. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, how various factions in the game or uh, gamers' choices or other things will affect uh, the music in the game? I would say pretty much all of them. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for being just just plain about it, but actually it's, it is how it is. We have, what, nine gangs, if I'm not mistaken, counting. Each of those gangs have their own set of music. Uh, we obviously have Police Force, which also has its own music. Our main experience from The Witcher was that we kind of learned how to make AAA games in terms of musical landscape, and now we just had to make it bigger. It sounds obviously easy, it wasn't easy as at all, but um, uh, I think that's the process in a nutshell. Mm. The game is much more dense than, than The Witcher was, even in the most dense places. Like, you would take um, Novigrad or, or Oxenford for, for comparison with Night City, it wouldn't even stand a chance. So, you know, adding all of that uh, required us to, to actually think about all this stuff and how does it, you know, flow to, you know, together. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, the sheer uh, scale of the game uh, that we already saw uh, during various uh, events uh, done by uh, CDPR, uh, I have to ask, where did you draw your inspirations from? I've heard that you uh, drew from the lore, 
of the of the original pen and paper RPG you drew from each other were there other inspirations that you you obviously could pinpoint that these are the things I I don't know movies soundtracks mu music or, or books that that inspired you to 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 do uh, this soundtrack uh, justice he's going first <laughs> okay so I can start uh, for me it's actually uh, it's pretty simple because I feel with electronic music, your focus should be on timbre and color of the sound. So the moment I discovered and got my hands on uh, this instrument, Folktech Mescaline, that was basically my way into the, <laughs> the game and to the music. And, you know, from this point on, exactly this one. Good morning. So each one, of, each one of you has a one of these yeah. Yeah. at the studio. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, I, I guess if you spend enough time, you could probably score the whole game just with this little thing. Because, <laughs> you know, yeah, if you spend do, your life doing it. Yeah, I mean, but it can do everything, really. I mean, from lush pads for emotional scenes, you know, tension cues, combat cues, you name it. It, it can really do everything. So, you know, once I started messing with that, everything sort of fell into place. So I, I would agree with that as far as you know, the, the timbres and as far as the sound. I think it's very easy sometimes to have a drum-led soundtrack where you just rely on the beats pounding and pounding to get the energy. Mm. Whereas I think we've almost gone the other way on this, which is we've got the energy coming from a lot of driving bass lines, from a lot of these sounds. And it's very easy with electronica. It, a lot of people say it feels cold, that there's no heart, there's no soul to it. I would completely disagree with that because what we've achieved with these sounds is there is a real warmth and dissonance and distortion and you're using all of these sounds but distortion can be this beautiful thing and you you think about this dystopian world you think about the cyberpunk land and obviously it's been done so many times as far as you know the actual if you're reading the books if you're reading the comics if you're reading akira what you're seeing akira whatever all of these things that have created the cyberpunk landscape coming up to now and you see the visuals that these guys have done in the game. I mean, it is absolutely mind boggling. Mm. It's impossible not to be inspired by it. So when you start mucking around in all these synthesizers and creating these sounds and getting underneath it, it's, you start, it's weird because the two start marrying together and you've got the music, which is really creating the emotion for this game. And it's not just this cold place. Yeah, it's hard. Yeah, it's violent, but there is a real warmth to some of this music while at the same time, it's got this real driving beat getting on the edge of your seats. Mm. Yeah, I completely agree. I would also add one tiny detail that overall, when we talk about inspirations or referencing ourselves to 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 other works of art or, or culture uh we cannot forget about one thing which i i need to say loudly because um there have been some misconceptions about where our music comes from so usually uh when you talk to people about cyberpunk in general they would uh, automatically made an, uh, a connection between cyberpunk and 1980s because we had a Blade Runner because there's uh, a big scene of synthwave art outrun and retrowave music out there while in our case uh, we didn't draw from the 80s that much I would even say that we tried to constrain ourselves uh from drawing from the 80s because what we have been looking above all in music is this edge uh night city for us is a colorful dynamic fast and very violent place so the music had to reflect that and we found out during the production phase that it's actually the 90s we are we are interested in rather than the 80s so uh if we would consider that whole inspiration thing in a more more broad aspect i think that would be also an important thing to say okay but i would also say on that where we intentionally didn't go down the 80s route or the 90s route or the noughties yeah there are elements from it but i think with anything yeah, everyone always goes oh so is it blade runner <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's like well, yes, you know, it's impossible to get away from the fact that that sound was created for Blade Runner. So if you go and try and take those sounds, you automatically, it's already been done and it's been done wonderfully. So what's the point of doing that? Yeah, and I think exactly. it's said, mm -hmm. So you have these elements of different sounds, sure. 
but it's much more the edginess of the early 90s that we've got in this rather than what i would say the retroness of the 80s mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. great and this is a this is a great po uh, point to to ask another question that i w wanted to ask you for a long long time actually i wanted to ask this question since the uh, premiere of the uh, e3 2018 uh, trailer that uh, uh, incorporated one particular track that started a complete uh, craze over the internet hyper uh, track uh, spoiler used in 2018's uh, e3 tra trailer sparked mid-tempo electro house craze around the uh, the internet Artists like Nightmare Owl, Fool, Rez, Extra Terra are doing their best promoting, creating and playing music online, while other achieved electronic musicians experiment with 90 BPM heavy thumping tracks. Did you consider that uh, other artists are already trying to define what cyberpunk uh, sounds like, or have you chosen a path that will sound completely different uh, than expected of, of that? new trope that they they're trying to define well i didn't think i'll jump in while martin's getting his head together because <laughs> i'm wide awake at 8 30 in the morning <laughs> but i don't think you try and imitate other people what's the point it's been done before so you might have people from a trailer two years ago going we'll try this beat we'll try that beat we're already coming up with stuff we're already a fair fair way through by that stage anyway but i think also there's no point worrying about what other people do. If you try and imitate what other people are doing, by the time your product's out in a year's time or two years time, it already sounds dated anyway, mm. because you're trying to do something which is inverted commas trendy. So I think you just stick to what you believe in, what you think is right for mm. the soundtrack, and you just go with your gut instincts and you hope that people like it. Mm. Well, I got, I've got myself hanged because I started to think about it from rather different perspective. Uh, First of all, you, you've mentioned that mid-tempo thing. Uh, we actually chose music with that particular pacing, not by accident. Uh, if you listen closely to The Witcher 3 soundtrack, you will discover that most of the combat tracks are actually done the opposite way. Uh, the guidebooks or, you know, standard set of rules would uh, suggest you to do. Normally, uh, when other composers approach me and we, and we talk about crafts, uh, they often, you know, come from this very quick conclusion that whenever the action is about to sped up in game, the music should also pick up the tempo and mm -hmm. be faster. And, what we did with what we did with the Witcher was actually quite the opposite. So whenever Geralt was about to enter combat, uh, we were deliberately implementing slower paced combat tracks that would have more, you know, laid down groove, which would automatically automatically make it more punchy. And that's what that's what we were actually chasing for with this particular tr trailer. And um, obviously, when you deal with, you know, well-known IP uh, and you tick all the boxes and, you know, do the good, do a good job and meet, and people start, start to enjoy it, um, it may happen that imitators uh, arise. But on the other hand, we had the same situations when Inception came out, for example, right? Mm -hmm. We had that first announcement trailer of Inception with famous Brahm sound. And suddenly, 10 years later, everyone is using that everywhere. Mm. Mm. So, yeah, I would agree with Paul that it's all about finding your own voice, your own path, and not really being occupied whether or not it's going to be picked up by someone. Because in the end, it's all about you being the first one who come up, comes up with, with a specific idea. Mm. Okay. Um... Uh, another question for uh, Paul, especially, uh, be because, well, you're the only one who can answer that. I believe most will agree that the closest thing to cyberpunk of your previous works would be, obviously, soundtrack for Dread. Um, did you immediately feel at home with 2077, or did you uh, did it took uh, a lot of thinking to create music similar yet different, or 
or was it completely, completely something different? I remember the first chat that I had with mm. uh, CD Projekt Red, and it was about a two-hour Skype, and they were all about to go and hit the bar at about 7 p.m. They were going, can we hurry up and get this Skype finished? <laughs> uh, but I remember talking about it, and they were telling me about what the game was about. And obviously, um, cyberpunk as a genre, I absolutely adore. But the game itself, and this was whenever it was, how many years ago, and we were talking about it. And Marcin had said, oh, you know, obviously I'm aware of your dread work and I like your synth work, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that's right for the game. You know, it's like you can go to someone and say, hey, you write wonderful orchestral music. Well, that's great, but it doesn't mean that that's going to be right for this, for this sound of whatever score you're doing. And when we spoke about it and you gradually start trying to work out, well, what is it that you liked about dread for example and it had this real kind of cool electronica vibe underneath it but there were other elements of it which are totally not relevant to this at all so it's a good starting point to have a, i guess a musical language to go well i like that and i like that and i like that but i think you know as as pt said you know after a, six months to a year of actually playing you started off here because you need somewhere as a musical reference and then you gradually go down it's like well i did this kind of thing and i mucked around with these kind of synths but gradually, as we're then finding our own sound together, the three of us, God, I mean, it, it seems like forever ago, even the mention of the word dread, because it's really nothing like that other than the fact that it's electronic. You know, you always need a starting point, whether it's a director or a musical director or a collaborator or a composer or whatever. You need something to start with so that someone goes, I like electronic. I like orchestral. I like hardcore guitar. But by the way, I would also say that there's a reference point, particularly with those two against me, where they're talking about some bands that I haven't necessarily heard of. And I'm talking about some bands that they haven't heard of. So we start sending each other beats to go, oh, that's interesting. That's a lot tighter kick drum than I would have thought of doing before. And simply I'm sending stuff to them and they're going, right, OK, you've gone down the wrong path with that. Not that it's not good, but it's not right for this. Have a listen to this. I think that's fair enough, isn't it? And so then gradually we got Elan in on the drums and my God, that transformed it because suddenly we're all crunching up the beats in different ways and we're getting all these guys in. And again, so it's really just about finding your musical voice that you're all comfy with, but you're not trying to, I'm not trying to imitate PT. I'm not trying to imitate Marcin. Thank God they're not trying to imitate me because it'd be hell. <laughs> so it's like, but you're finding your own voice. And in the end, the three of us are working together, but doing our own thing. How did your cooperation look like? What did you learn from each other during this period? That I'm crap at mixing. PC, <laughs> <laughs> go for it. Um, you know, the, the way we divided work uh, was so that uh, Paul got the bulk of the Arasaka material to write. So basically, whenever you deal with Arasaka, it's Paul. And that was something that was actually pre-planned and something that wasn't really pre-planned, but sort of made sense when we started dividing up the work was give Paul a lot of the material that deals with the city, uh, the city being, you know, the villain in the game. And, you know, there's some grimy, noir kind of, kind of uh, cues that Paul wrote. So, and obviously, you know, that it's not only that, but those two, I feel, were the biggest... Uh, the most sort of concise parts of the game that he worked on and I did a lot of stuff. I I've, I've mainly did most of the Johnny Silverhand uh, cues mm -hmm. plus, you know, Nomads and other stuff. And I guess Martin can say what he did. My part uh, for the quests was uh, to cover uh, some gangs. So I did uh, Tiger Claws, I did uh, Six Street, for example. Uh, other than that, uh, my main role with with the score was to take uh, take care about all the brain dance sequences as well as, as cyberspace in general. Mm. So so that's me. And apart from from other things, well, me working also as as a music music director for this project required me also to divide my time 
to more production duties as well. So that joke with meetings was actually a true story. So, you know, that also consumes time. And also making sure that, you know, our work uh, kind of clicks together uh, between all the departments involved, because once you start to implement music, uh, you know, the quest design team has its own take on that. The gameplay team obviously has a, has their own take. There, then there's a cinematics team, because even though the game is set on the first person perspective, doesn't mean uh, we do not have cinematic moments uh, whatsoever. The game is full of, of them. So so my, my job also making sure that, uh, you know, the process is streamlined, that basically we can all work towards the same goal and, and you know, uh, finish that with uh, more or less ease, I would say. Yeah, because people tend to forget that uh, music composition for, for video games is not just only gluing uh, parts together, creating sounds and, and putting them into a nicely, nice, tidy uh, hour and a half soundtrack, but it's also an implementation nightmare. Especially for Braindance, I wanted to ask you about that. Did you have to develop a new... Um, new tools to to make uh, the brain dance uh, um, sequences work with this uh, active pause with uh, with uh, um, with active um, camera movement during the pause sequences. Well, I was trying to be academic and scientific about it, but I quickly realized it doesn't make sense at mm -hmm. all. Uh, and instead of being focused on the technicalities, I should rather focus on the emotional delivery on, mm. or, or of a given scene. Uh, we have uh, quite a few moments where V enters enters brain dance mm -hmm. in why, one way or another, and for us, um, it comes to a basic division really. So you can experience brain dance like you would experience a movie, which you take part in. And once you, you know, watch through the whole timeline, you can start to mess around with it. Fast forward, re rewind, change the camera, as you said, uh, etc. So um, we, we made it in a way that once you go out of the spectator mode, you enter the edit mode, as we call it. Uh, so the music also changes to more, uh, I would say, neutral in terms of emotions, because at this moment, you know what's going on uh, with the story of, of a given brain dance, and now you have to solve a riddle. So whenever you enter the brain dance, you are experiencing it as a movie. So the music has to be, uh, you know, has to play accordingly to, to to whatever is going on on screen. And once you go out into the edit mode, the music kind of, you know, um, eases out on, on the tension and uh, goes towards more, yeah, neutral background. Right. Um, last question. I have to ask this: Did did COVID pandemic influence the way you work, or it was just day another day at the office because we all uh, composers and game designers work and uh, by by the computer, so it was just different place, but the same equipment. <laughs> well, if if there was there was no COVID, I probably or both Piotr and I would probably visit Paul more often. Mm. Uh, that, that actually uh, couldn't happen due to the pandemic, but I think to some degree composer's work is a solitary experience. Mm. Uh, obviously you go out to a recording session, for example, you work with you know living and breathing musicians to make arts together, but then you're back at your machine in your studio alone of your thoughts and ideas and it's up to you to to you know transform them into the music so from my perspective um it's like you know it's day like any other really it's okay. a, you now have a beautiful studio to work in yeah well yeah that's that's that too <laughs> what about you pt well i love home office really <laughs> <laughs> So and also, you know, uh, the the majority of the creative work was already done when the whole COVID situation started. So we were mostly focused on bug fixing and playthroughs and stuff like that, doing some, you know, implementation that was left. And 
you know, there was very, very few cues that we had to write uh, after COVID hit. Mm. I mean, we were mixing, or I was mixing my stuff. We had to do it remotely um, for, for my cues. So, you know, after you've written them all, these two are absolute geniuses and it all sounds wonderful. My stuff sounds like <laughs> crap. So then I get a mixer in to make it sound bloody amazing. And I remember Jason LaRocca, who's here in LA, um, who's mixing uh, some of my stuff for implementation. And he's only right, an hour and, a, hour and a half away. It's like three miles in LA, you know, it takes about an hour and a half, but it's, um, so I was stuck here and we were having to kind of live stream it as far as like, I would be listening in through my, through my speakers here. And the git was, is quite frustrating because it's the fun part is actually at the end of a project when you get to be with these people and going, okay, well, let's hear it in someone else's studio or let's raise the faders or let's do this. And obviously I wasn't able to, but it did lead to this awful moment where I just tweeted a picture of going like, oh yeah, here I am mixing, you know, isn't this fun? And it made me realize how keen the entire world is for this game, uh, if I didn't know this after three years of working on this. <laughs> because I happened to have a wallpaper on there, which was, I think, the hit any key button from the 2018 trailer. And within about minus five seconds, someone had gone, oh, look, new visuals for Cyberpunk. <laughs> and my heart was sinking. So while Jason's going, what do you think of this mix? I'm going, I feel sick. I can't concentrate. <laughs> Fortunately, apparently it was from the trailer and it wasn't brand new stuff from the game. But after a while, you just forget what you're actually looking at on the screen. Mm. Okay, thank you guys for, for this interview. Thank you, uh, Paul, for uh, for the music. Also, I have to do this because I love Warhammer 40k and I love what you did with Dawn of War 3 soundtrack, especially the trailer, because it gave me chills and I immediately had to try to uh, uh, sound design my very own sounds from this trailer. And I kind of did that and it was it was bloody amazing. Uh, thank you, PT. Thank you, Marcin, for, for your time. Uh, thank you, guys, at C CDPR for making this happen. Uh, have a great day.